We're just gonna give it a moment to let the waiting room clear before we get started. And if everyone can make sure they're muted when they enter. All right. Good afternoon. This is a hearing before the Boston Cannabis Board, the BCB. Today is January 17th, 2024. Today's hearing is being conducted pursuant to certain temporary amendments to the open meeting law. This is what allows us to meet virtually. This hearing is being recorded and will be posted to the City of Boston's website. Before I review some procedural matters, I will introduce Chairwoman Kathleen Joyce. Thank you, Jasmine. Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Joyce. I'm chair of the Boston Cannabis Board. And today I am pleased to be joined by Commissioner Lisa Holmes, Commissioner John Smith, Commissioner Gabe Camacho, Commissioner Sono Gandhi, and Commissioner Soto. Thank you, Chairwoman Joyce. My name is Jasmine Wynn, and I am the Boston Cannabis Board Manager. I will begin by calling each item as they appear on the agenda. I will then ask who is present on behalf of the proposal before us. The first two items are amendments to already approved establishments, so they will have five minutes each to present to the BTB, and then we will move on to our new license application, in which they will have 10 minutes to present to the BCB, followed by questions from the board members. We will then take public testimony, beginning with elected officials or their representatives, followed by the general public. Quick housekeeping matter, item number three on the agenda, MJ2 Home LLC, has been rescheduled to the BTB's February agenda. If you wish to testify, please sign up via the link that I will put in the chat. If you have done so already, you do not have to do it again. Additionally, you may use the chat function to request to testify. Please wait until the matter in which you would like to speak about is called. Do not use the chat function to give testimony. It will not be considered. Please state your full name, address, and affiliation, if any. Testimony will be limited to two minutes, at which time you will be muted. Additional testimony may be submitted in writing to cannabisboard at boston.gov. The record will be kept open until Tuesday, January 23rd at 5 p.m. The BCB does not give any more weight to spoken testimony than it does written testimony. We will begin with our first, first item, which is Low Key 2 LLC, DBA Low Key Dispensary. The license premise is 5252 to 5270 Washington Street in West Roxbury. This is a retail recreational cannabis dispensary and the request is to amend the description of premise from 5252 to 5270 Washington Street, West Roxbury, to 5268 Washington Street in West Roxbury. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Uh, I'm here, Jeff Similian. Okay, Jeff. Do you have access to your video? I'm sorry? Not, okay. Do you have, are you able to give video or? Yeah, sure. Okay. You know, we like to see your face. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right, thank you. So you will have five minutes, you may begin. Sure, good morning, everybody. I'm Jeff Similian, CEO of Loki Dispensary. Um, reason why I'm here today is to propose a, a change of suite uh, for our dispensary. Um, currently, we are um, at 5260, 5270 Washington Street. Um, which is a space that is relatively uh, bigger than what we assume and we expected um, to to run our business. Currently, we have a location in Dorchester at 17 or three square foot, um, and, and it's, it's it's going well. We are able to do everything that we are with that we need to do within that small square footage. Um, unfortunately, we don't necessarily need 4,000 square feet. So currently, um, the building, uh, which is a, a building that I currently own, one of the tenant is. Um, looking to um, close down his business and it makes more sense to uh, uh, just uh, be able to shift the the, the location uh, from what we will propose to this currently look to this um, to the current suite um, so it would just be something that uh, would make much more sense for us um, uh, to be able financially um, to help us get us operational as soon as possible thank you Jeff uh, chairwoman Joyce, do you have any questions? Uh, thank you. Based on your testimony, I have no questions at this time. Commissioner Camacho? Uh, no questions. Commissioner Holmes? Commissioner Smith? Thank you, Jasmine. No questions. Commissioner Gandhi? No questions. Commissioner Soto? No question. 
Okay, we'll now move to public testimony, beginning with elected officials or their representative. Is there anyone that would like to speak on this proposal? Seeing no hands raised, the board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you, Jeff. All right. The next item we have is 617 Therapeutic Healthcare Inc., DBA 617 THC. The license firm is 144 Bolden Street, Dorchester. The license type is a retail recreational cannabis dispensary. The request is to amend the operating hours. The current hours are Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., Saturday, 10 p.m. to 6 p.m., 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., sorry, and Sunday, noon to 6 p.m. The proposed hours of operation are Monday through Sunday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Pete D'Agostino. Thank you, Pete. You have five minutes. You may begin. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Pete D'Agostino here on behalf of 617. If I could, I'll just bring up my screen quickly. Uh, as Jasmine mentioned, we are here to discuss a proposed change of hours. Um, just by way of background for the new members, um, we were before the board back in uh, maybe June of last year. There was a technical error in our um, hours in which Friday was not included. At that point, the board had decided uh, to, they, they recognized, we went back through the public record, as you may remember, uh, and there was just a technical correction we made. I advised uh, my client at that time who was seeking to expand their hours beyond what was originally proposed. I, my advice to them was to open for a few months to see how it goes before we um, just jumped into expanding the hours. So they've now been open for about six months. Uh, they've received quite a bit of feedback, quite frankly, from the from the customers that the Saturday and Sunday hours specifically really just are not working. Uh, so we came back. So we've tried it for the last six or seven months. Uh, and we're now back before the board for the Monday through Sunday, nine to nine. We did um, do quite a bit of outreach. ONS held a meeting on December 14th. We did collect signatures in support of expanding our hours and provided over 200 signatures to the uh, board for their consideration. We've communicated with all of the neighborhood groups that we have listed here, Bowdoin, Geneva, Main Streets. They've come in support. They supported it at our meeting on the on December 14th. Cape Verdean Association, Greater Boston, Bowdoin, Geneva Neighborhood Association. Uh, we've, we've spoken to all of the neighborhood groups um, and no one's raised any concerns around the expanded hours. Um, and in fact, some already testified and supported our ONS meeting. Local law enforcement, we've had a great relationship with them. They indicate that they don't have any complaints uh, that they've received about the uh, regarding the store, uh, and they didn't raise any concerns with us about span expanding the hours when we spoke with them. So pretty straightforward. Um, these hours will more closely align with the other cannabis stores in the area who are already open um, the same or similar hours to what we're requesting here. So with that, I'll turn it back to the board and be available for any questions the board may have. Thank you, Pete. Um, Chairman Joyce, do you have any questions? Uh, thanks, Pete. Um, do you have any idea on Saturday and Sunday? So those are busiest days of the week? Well, quite frankly, they're probably not because we're closing so early. Okay. Uh, we're closing at six, which is uh, pretty challenging. Um, and really the genesis of this was the neighbors and the and uh, 617 came to me and said, you know, we're really, really wanting, you know, that everybody's saying you guys are closing too early, you're closing too early. Uh, and I said, you guys got to try it for six months before we go back to the board. And so I thought that was a reasonable amount of time to test it. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, if the neighbors really support it, let's get a petition going so we can demonstrate that. And, you know, it was overwhelmingly supported by our customers. So I thought it was an appropriate time to bring it back before the board for consideration. All right. Thank you. That's uh, that's helpful and considerate. I have no questions or comments. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Camacho? Uh, no questions. Commissioner Smith? Thanks, Jasmine. No questions. Commissioner Gandhi? Uh, thanks, Jasmine. Uh, one question. Um, do you have the staffing um, to accommodate these extra hours? And we do. We do have the staffing. And in fact, our staff appeared at the ONS meeting and they were hopeful that it would be adopted so that they could work more hours uh, because it's limiting the amount of hours they can work. So they were at the OS hearing, ONS hearing and, and had specifically mentioned that, that they were hoping they could get more hours uh, by the expansion of the, um, the store being open more. So uh, it's another good reason, uh, hopefully, for the board to consider supporting it. 
Okay, and, and um, are any of your staff Boston residents? Of course, yeah. Most uh, uh, most of the staffs from the neighborhood. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, oh, No other questions. Thank you, Commissioner Holmes. No, no questions at this time. Thank you, Commissioner Soto. No questions. Thank you. All right, we will move to public testimony, beginning with elected officials or their representatives. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, Connor Newman with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. This time, the Mayor's Office like to defer to the judgment of this board. Some background information in the community process uh, can confirm that ONS hosted an abutters meeting on December 14th. I understand that those in attendance were supportive of this proposal, um, including the Greater Bowdoin Geneva uh, Main Streets. Uh, we're unaware of any concerns at this time. We'd like to defer to the judgment of this board. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. Are there any other elected officials or their representatives that would like to speak? Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this proposal? Seeing no hands raised, the board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, board. Yeah. Um, so now we will move to our new license applications. Again, item number three on the agenda, MJ to Home LLC has been rescheduled to the BCB's February agenda. So we will move to our fourth item. The applicant is Be Well Organic Medicine, Inc., DBA Fenway Cannabis Company. The proposed license premise is 120 Brookline Avenue, Fenway, Kenmore. The license type is a recreational cannabis dispensary license. The proposed hours of operation are 9 a.m. to 11 p.m., seven days a week. This is a non-equity applicant. They initially filed on November 7th, 2023. They filed with inspectional services on November 6th, 2023, and they have their community meeting on December 12th, 2023. There is a buffer zone conflict with another cannabis establishment. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Good morning, this is Matt Richmond, CEO and president of Bewell Organic Medicine and Family Cannabis Company. Thank you. Sarah Grant from Smith Custom Crawford here as well. Thank you. And good afternoon. My name is April Oskowski. Okay, thank you. So you have 10 minutes to present. You may share your screen and begin. Sarah, are you going to share your screen for me or should I? I will do it right now. All right, perfect. And I'll just tell you when to switch slides. Okay. All right, great. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Matt Richmond, and as I mentioned, I'm the CEO of uh, Below Organic Medicine and our wholly owned subsidiary family cannabis company. First, I'd like to just thank you for having us on the agenda and having us attend us for the meeting. I'll jump right in and I'll be happy to answer any questions once I finish the uh, quick presentation. So to start, go to the next slide, please. So the the Proposed transaction basically is Fenway Cannabis Company is buying the assets of MedMen Boston, which is the store located at 120 Brookline. It's an asset purchase. We're just buying the license and the assets of the store. The facility is leased from a local landlord, Samuels and Company. It'll continue to be leased from them. We've renegotiated a lease with them going forward. Um, Fenway Cannabis Company is a brand new entity that we created. It's 100% owned by Bewell. It's set up to own the license for the store in Boston. And Bewell Organic Medicine has been operating since late 2019 in Massachusetts. We're a small, vertically integrated company. And the only uh, state we have operations in is Massachusetts. And there are no significant changes planned for the, for the current site. Next slide, please. So um, the store at 120 Brookline has struggled uh, for a couple of years for a variety of reasons. Uh, one being that it's on an island effectively with the current owner of the store being out west and really having no operations here in Massachusetts. I think one of the big differences with us ideally being able to take over operation of the store is that we are completely Massachusetts based and we have all the resources here to support that store and to drive that store to be successful. Um, our, uh, our headquarters are located in uh, Lowell, which is where we have both production and cultivation. And we have a uh, medical and recreational store in Merrimack, 
that store has been operational since early 2020 as medical, and we added the recreational license to that uh, in June of last year. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, as far as the, the Be Well leadership team, so, um, sorry, I just got my slide confused. So, Be Well is owned by two individuals. Uh, we are not um, owned by any equity firms or any other institutional investors. Uh, two individuals, they each own 50% of our business. They've been investors since 2017, and they um, not only have their own track record as business, business folks themselves, but have a very keen interest in the medical side of the business, which is where we started the business originally in medical. Um, myself, I've been running cannabis companies since early 2018. I started that in Colorado. I moved here to Massachusetts last year to take over uh, the Be Well business. Um, I come from finance and public accounting, kind of not a normal track um, for the cannabis CEO, but um, I'm a finance person by heart. I'm a compliance person by heart. I was an auditor for many years uh, back in the day. So, um, Hi, Matt. Sorry, yeah. your audio is a little sketchy. Okay, I'll try to speak up if that's yes, better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide. But like I said, I started my career in uh, audit and risk management. Um, the Be Well business, it's we're, like I said, we're a small business. Um, we only have 35 employees prior to uh, adding the store in Boston. But one of the things that's really important to us is our commitment to the community. And I think our track record speaks very well for itself in the communities we operate in, up here in Lowell and in Maryland. Um, not only do we try to not only contribute, you know, financially and with the resources that we have, but we want to be an active participant in the things that happen in our neighborhood. So whether it's a fair that's happening in Merrimack or a haunted house at a fired house or whatever it may be, we try to be in attendance and show our support for the team as well as they show their support for us. Um, historically, we've had great relations with not only the fire and police department, but all the building services departments as well. Um, our cultivation in Lowell is open for anybody to come visit at any point in time. We're actually trying to get the fire chief and police chief from Merrimack to get over there because they'd like to come through. Um, you know, we, we try to open up our doors and, you know, uh, be pretty transparent to the community that we're operating in. Um, that's pretty important to us. Um, not only do we, like I said, we donate money and our time, but we try to find things that we think make an impact in the community. So like, for example, if there's a need for um, services and equipment for disabled uh, children in schools, we'll try to get involved and make contribution there. Or if there's something with, for example, the Council on Aging is a big deal for us in Merrimack, we'll get involved with that group and try to help educate and obviously support their, uh, their types of initiatives. So we really try to be involved besides just writing checks. Uh, the next slide. Uh, industry commitment. So I mean, regulation and compliance is critical in our space. And our view on the matter is very simple. We think that a well-regulated industry that operates efficiently is really critical to the success of marijuana companies in the legal business. Um, you know, all states have different regulatory frameworks. Everybody's always constantly developing them and improving them. But we try to be on the front end of that, and we'd like to help and try to have an open book with our regulators, as well as share with them anything that we might have observed, um, because we think helping the regulators helps the industry uh, very effectively. Next slide, please. Um, training is a big focus for cannabis companies. Um, certainly not anything that we we cut we uh, hold back on here. Everybody that works at our company has to go through a variety of different trainings. Um, responsible vendor training is, of course, um, something that we do independently. But all these other programs, uh, our folks are trained on day one, um, depending on their position. But in particular, when we think about workplace safety, security, visitor verification, diversion, these are certainly some things that are very high on the list. And I'll talk more about them in just a minute. You can go on. So security, uh, security is critical for dispensary as well as for any other marijuana operating facility. 
um, not only the physical security of the facility, but the IT security as well, um, and the maintenance of the information that we maintain in our systems and that all being secured. Um, the facility that we're acquiring at 120 Brookline has state-of-the-art security systems, has full camera coverage, has all digital access controls. Um, it's set up very well um, from that perspective. Um, we uh, don't intend to really make any changes to it because it works perfectly as it is today. Um, it has full backup from a generator as well as it has a uh, computer for our backup, battery backup as well. Um, Next slide, please. Um, preventing diversion to minors, um, one of the top items in our industry. Um, and when I talk about this, I often talk about diversion happening in two ways. One is through legal sales of marijuana, and one is through illegally obtaining the marijuana. And so from our, from our perspective as a dispensary, not only do we have to make sure that we're only dispensing to uh, persons that are 21 and older with proper uh, valid identification, but that our, that our facility is secure and safe so that product is not being illegally obtained from us, whether it's through break-ins or robberies or things like that. Um, I've been in the business for six years. Um, fortunately, in Massachusetts, I've never had to experience a break-in, but I've experienced many of them in Colorado. And my experience has told me that the vast majority of product that gets out um, out of the legal channel comes from these illegal kind of ways to basically break into stores and get product. So not only um, through making sure we're selling to only the right people, but when you come into the facility, not only does it have to be secure, but it has to have layers of security so that, you know, somebody might be able to make it into the front door, but they're not going to make it past the front door into the next room. They're not going to make it from that room into the vault room. The vault room is set up um, to CCC standards, including having wire mesh all throughout the walls. So the facility is definitely set up very well um, from both the safe and secure sale of marijuana. Next slide, please. Nuisance prevention, I'll just touch for a second on here. From our perspective, nuisance prevention applies not only inside of our store, but outside of our store and in the area around it. Um, we, we know the area down there very well, um, I've been down there a lot for the past eight, nine months, actually, and monitoring and not to say policing, but effectively almost policing the area around the store is something that we will basically take an active role in doing. And if there is a nuisance that's occurring outside of our store, I expect it to be our responsibility to try to, uh, you know, not have that happen. And of course, contact local local law enforcement as necessary. Next slide. Um, this is my last slide. I'll just talk for just one second on this and then I'll move to a couple of points just to wrap up. Um, the store, like I mentioned at the beginning, has been struggling uh, for years. It's down to currently seven employees. Um, it needs to have much more than that. Um, the sales have dropped dramatically at the store over the past couple of years, in particular the last year. Um, and so as we come in to take over, revitalize, reinvigorate the store, it is fully our intention to make this store successful. Uh, one of the key things in making it successful is not only um, having proper operating hours, which is one of the things that we've requested in our application, but we also need to have more staff. And so we'll be adding eight to 13 full-time jobs to the store. My expectation is that once we get through the licensing process and if we're successful with, with BCB and zoning, we would be moving to hire four or so people immediately. And then once we get into March and the beginning of April, we'll be looking to add four to eight more people. But my expectation is that the store that has seven people today, once we have it operating and we're out into the spring and summertime and it's running the way we'd like to see it, the store will easily staff 20 full-time people. So um, that's very exciting for us. Um, we are committed to hiring local residents, contractors and vendors, as well as diverse workforce. In the store currently today, out of the seven that work in the store, five of them reside in Boston. <clears throat> Two of them are from diverse backgrounds. 
and our hiring effort um, going forward will continue to be along those lines. We've already been working with Cultivate ED on lining up um, some potential uh, folks that we can bring in for jobs there as well. So that's a big push for us. Monetarily, I've mentioned the impact we like to make, but not only with charity, but with our time and the things that we can do to be active in the community. And so just to wrap up, you know, we're super excited to be able to come into Boston. Um, the Fenway location, the Fenway neighborhood is really exciting for us. We're very much, I mean, everybody thinks about Fenway and the first thing that comes to everybody's mind is Fenway Park and there's a baseball stadium there. That's great. That's really exciting. But the core of the business is the local community. And so this is how we built our business to date. This is how I built my business in Colorado. And so there are 55,000 residents in the Fenway Kimmore area. I don't know how many thousands of workers are there. There are massive construction projects going on, with construction workers everywhere. Um, our job is to cater to the local community. And I think that's actually being missed in the Fenway Kenmore area right now. And so baseball is great. There's a lot of people going to games. There'll be more traffic on those days. But the bread and butter of the business is really building it with the local community. And that's what's going to not only you know, make us a, have a positive impact, but will also carry us through winter months, you know, when there's not a lot of events going on, et cetera. So um, I think our approach there is very much a, you know, kind of on the ground, hands on, you know, let's build our relations with the neighborhood and then baseball and other things just come with gravy on top of it. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to my presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Matt. I'm going to go a little out of order. I see Councilor Durkin has her hand raised, so I'm going to let her speak before we move to questions and comments from the commissioners. Okay, I just wanted to speak in support. Um, I expressed my, so I already sent this um, in to, uh, to you all, but um, I wanted to speak in support. Um, this dispensary already exists, but obviously would continue under new ownership. Um, as the recreational cannabis industry grows and competition among these businesses grows, I believe we should give these establishments the proper avenue to choose and place themselves in high areas of traffic and business. Given that this location is already used as a dispensary and our office has received no negative feedback from the business, I believe that this transfer of ownership of this location from one dispensary to another should pose no issue for the community. As a city councilor for District 8, it's my job to ensure that businesses contribute to the vibrancy and diverse retail environment of our communities. And I believe the business should be able to move forward in the process to change over ownership. Um, so I urge the commission to support uh, this business today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, now we'll move to comments and questions from the board members, starting with Chairwoman Joyce. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, thank you, Matt, for your overview of your um, application. Um, so we're tasked with, you know, one of the things we're tasked with is making sure that these establishments succeed. And part of your testimony at the beginning was that you're taking this over because the previous uh, management group or owners weren't able to succeed. And you think that being locally based is the key to uh, making this location more successful. Is that right? Am I summing that up correctly? I think that's that's one of the reasons for sure. I can expand on that if you would like. Yes, I would. There is a buffer zone here. I know I know this location was existed before the buffer zone existed, but you know, these are things we want to make sure that we're setting our businesses up for success. So if you could just tease it out a little bit, elaborate um how you see this, how you see what you're bringing to the neighborhood or what you're bringing to the business model is different and will be more successful than the previous. Absolutely. So um, obviously, so being local is, is going to be a big difference because we have, you know, a whole company of employees here and a whole infrastructure to support the store. The store has basically been run by absentee owner. Um, MedMen is obviously in Nevada and California. They had great plans for the store when they first opened it up. Um, unfortunately, I think some things went against them. Um, Timing sometimes of getting licenses, right, can take a lot longer. Um, the rental agreement they agreed to in the beginning with the landlord, so this was kind of back in the beginning, right, where it was just grabbing space as fast as they could, was actually not sustainable. 
he just couldn't make money with the rent the way that it was structured um, under the original agreement. The store had no marketing support. The store had no outreach to customers. The store's visibility in terms of its signage is terrible. Uh, the store's not lit well, so it's really just kind of sitting there. Um, there's a lot of things from that perspective. Just in, inside the store, lack of inventory, lack of merchandising, a complete neglect of all the basics of running an effective retail store, especially when you look at running an effective cannabis retail store. So I think those are some of the big things. I think that store can succeed in many people's hands. I just don't think it will succeed in the MedMen company's hands. And, you know, not to, to beat a dead horse, but, you know, MedMen has no money. They're financially um, about to be bankrupt, is my understanding. Um, and they just don't have the wherewithal to support the store properly. Um Having the right number of people, having the right people trained, having the right inventory, having the right products from the right vendors, paying your vendors on time so they continue to supply your store. Um, all these things are critical, a marketing support function. And then I think one of the other things is we're a known company, even though we're small in Massachusetts. We have a wholesale business. We sell to about 30 or 40 accounts throughout the state. Our products are in a variety of stores in Boston already. We pride ourselves on having some of the best quality flour in the state. This is kind of my thing from my last company in Colorado. High quality products produced at a low cost that are environmentally sound. Um, and so having better products, having better service, having a full support from our company, having the financial resources to invest in the store, et cetera, et cetera. Those are some of the reasons why we're going to be successful. On top of which, uh, we have a great team of people that I've managed to assemble over the past year and a half from some of the best cannabis companies in the state. So I think we've got the right team to come in there and really drive that store to be incredibly successful. And right now, that store does half the volume of my Merrimack store. And Merrimack is a 6,000 uh, uh, person community. So... It's just really, I think it's it's a lot of neglect and lack of ability to make the right investments and have local presence. I will have an office in the store, as well as our marketing director will be office down there as well. So I'm in Lowell, but I'll also be there probably half my time or more. This is a very big undertaking for us. We're not a big company. Um, and so this is this is everything that we're doing right now is making the store successful. Does that help? Thank you. Yep. I have no further questions. Thank you. Commissioner Camacho. Yes, thank you, Matt. Um, you talked a lot about how the new management will be doing things differently, and it sounds good. Um, let's look at the labor side. You said you'll be hopefully having uh, 8 to 13 full-time jobs. What would be the starting rate? So the lowest paying job in the store is $18 an hour. That's entry level bud tender or sales associate. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, and you said you have a comprehensive um, benefits package, health care, dental, okay, vision. Um, that's it. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. Thank you. Commissioner Holmes? Uh, yeah, so good afternoon, Matt. Um, just some questions that weren't I, I didn't see in the um, um, presentation. Um, what is your security plan for both in-store and your transfer of both funds and product? Very good. So we uh, hire, we, we have our own security staff, so we don't use outsourced company. So we will have, this store will have three full-time security staff that rotate through, um, but we use our own people. We don't hire uh, outsource. Um, I think it's better. I think it gives a better feeling to the customers as well. Um, but one big thing for us in terms of security plan inside the store, which I notice a lot of stores don't do, and the store down there, this MedMen store does not have this set up. We have multiple security camera monitoring areas inside the store. 
So at reception, the security person can see every camera in the store and outside the store. The store manager in their office can see the store, the, all the cameras, as well at their registers. So it's a kind of a comprehensive view of everybody's always looking at the cameras. We do security audits once a month of all of our facilities. So making sure every piece of equipment is working properly. We test all of our own camera you know, uh, uh, surveillance retention generator, battery backup, everything. We do all that monthly. Um, so uh, from a security perspective, that's that. What was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. Uh, the transfer of your funds and of your product. Perfect. So so for transfer of product, um, MedMen actually has a separate area set up. So when you come into the lobby, there's a door that all deliveries go through behind security desk. And that door is locked. Once they come in, that's at the entrance to the vault, but separate from the vault. So all receiving activities happen behind locked doors uh, behind the sales floor uh, in the vault area. And then as far as cash transport, we use um, the armored car transport. I call it armored car. And sometimes they don't have armored car, but we use third-party transport for it. Okay. Um, as far as the training for your in-house security staff, how is that done and who does it? So uh, April, who's sitting next to me, um, actually does that. April is our director of HR and compliance. So when they're onboarded, they will go through all the security training. And then our controller slash building services manager will then go in the facility with them and make sure they know how to operate all the pieces of equipment, make sure they don't have to troubleshoot, et cetera, et cetera. So is your security, your in-house security staff, they're not, are they just security? They won't be doing bud tending. They won't be doing any, are they only security specialists? Security and reception. Okay. And they don't, they won't have any other response. They like, they won't fill in if a bud tender is not in or they, they don't perform other duties. Their main focus is security. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Soto. Hi. Uh, yes. Hi, Matt. Um, I, in just to build off of um, Commissioner Camacho's question, specific to the staff you would employ, I see in the um, documents that you would make efforts to attract uh, to attract Boston residents and diverse um, and a diverse employee pool, uh, potential employee pool. But I, I don't, I didn't see, and maybe I missed it, any like targets of like goals of numbers of folks that you would employ from Boston or from those different groups. And um, so, just wanted to see if there was more that I or that I missed something, or if there's more to that that you can. Um, uh, expound on. So, so good question. Thank you. So, I don't think I covered it, but we do have targets, right, April? For, um, and maybe one of my team can bring that up. We do have targets set for the amount of local and slash diverse hiring or that our makeup of our employee base down there. Um, I don't know if I have them handy right now. Uh, Sierra or Alexis, you might have them. Do you have them? I will check um, right now and see if I can find them for you. Yeah, if not, if you don't mind, you can submit it to Cannabis Board and I'll make sure it gets dispersed if you don't have it at this moment. Thank yeah. you. We can do that. So we have specific targets and then we also have um, a couple of mechanisms to try to achieve that. So like one that I mentioned before was working with Cult of ADD. Um, so there's a couple different pathways that we're going to take to be able to attract those types of folks that we're looking for. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Smith. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, hey, Matt, thank you for your presentation. Following up on Commissioner Soto, I was basically going to ask the same thing. I did not see a diversity plan and, and an employment plan, and I'm not clear about how you're thinking of recruiting, what your numbers are going to be, how you're thinking about um, minorities and women, that kind of thing. So it's not clear at all in your presentation. So wanted to get more information on that. Also, you talked about this um, in terms of your business um, integrated and all that. What do your numbers look like now? 
in terms of diversity, in terms of hiring folks with, with criminal record, quarries and all that? Do you have any sense of what that looks like? I do. Um, so for, so overall my business, um, we strive to be 40% women and we have achieved that goal as a business overall for Be Well prior to, you know, this next endeavor. Um, in our Merrimack store, we have 10 employees, eight are full-time, one is part-time. We have four males, five females, three persons of color, two persons that I identify as LGBTQ+, three persons with disabilities, and one veteran. I do not know if we have anybody there with a former criminal record. I have to check on that. Um, April just went to pull our diversity plan. We did file a diversity plan um, with the application, I believe. Is that correct, Sira? Yeah, I believe so. And, and we covered the goals as well in section four of the application overview, but I, I will be sure to resend those for sure, uh, Commissioner Smith. And then uh, just to, to kind of finish the other the story in, in uh, Boston, right now, of the seven employees, there are five males, two females, two persons of color in the current seven group. Okay, you said your starting salary is $18 an hour. What's the range? So the range for entry level bud tenders is 18 to 20. The range for leads is 22 to 24. Then we have a few like operations manager, sales manager roles. Those range between 55 and 70. And we have a assistant manager role and a general manager role. And those those range, uh, the AGM would be 50 to 65. And the GM would be 65 to 90. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Commissioner Gandhi. Good afternoon, Matt. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, my question is about square footage. Um, I didn't see how big the store is in the materials, the board memo that was submitted. I saw some of the uh, store information and the um, landlord information. So it's a two-part question. One, how what's the square footage of the store? Um, and number two, um, uh, building off of Kathleen's um, uh, uh, question about uh, making sure you're successful, um, it, it, it looks like um, the lease execution date was August 1st, 2023. So how is this lease different? And do you feel comfortable um, with uh, this lease structure, given that um, the, this, this might be a major, uh, major uh, cost to the business? Sure. Very good. Uh so the store is 6,600 square feet. So it's very big. Um, it's uh, basically the entire lower level of the 120 building. Um, that is split about approximately 55% sales floor, 45% back end. Okay, so a uh, very, very good size store, very big, actually, and a lot of room for us to do a lot inside of it. Um, it's very big. Um, if it was a little bigger, I would, I'd be concerned. Um, we're kind of on the edge of how big we'd like it to be. Um, but uh, but we, we actually like the size, we like the layout very much. Um, as far as the lease goes, so what we've been able to do with the landlord, and same as the company, has been a great partner. Uh, in this endeavor uh, all the way through. We basically renegotiated the lease to not only have our rent be the scaling depending upon the revenue of the business. So it's not percentage rent and that they get a percentage of our of our sales or anything, but the rent has tiers. So for the first year, our rent starts out at a fixed dollar amount, which is about four hundred and fifty, five hundred thousand dollars for the entire year. Okay, so basically very reduced rent for the first year to help us get the business out of the gate strongly. And obviously, Samuels and us have the same view, right? They've been stuck in this, not getting paid rent for years. So 
we both really wanted to achieve something that would be successful for both of us, that they would be able to get the rent, they'd be able to pay the rent, right, and be successful. So the first year was a big deal. The second piece is the rent stays at a minimum amount or a fixed minimum amount until our revenue exceeds $5 million. So if the store only does three or four million, we stay at our minimum rent, the store makes money based upon those numbers. No, assuming our, you know, my estimated gross margins, et cetera. As the rent goes up or as the sales go up, the rent then goes up, but at the same kind of rate so that when we get to $5 million in sales, the rent goes up a little bit, but we still make money. If the $6 million in sales, the rent goes up a little bit, we still make money. $7 million in sales, the rent goes up a little bit, we still make money. And then it's capped at that point in time. So the, one of the challenges Bedman had was not only having a huge lease, having all the rent payable right away, not having had a chance to ramp up the business and do anything like that. The other thing is the original lease had very, very aggressive rent escalators that were compounding every year. We negotiated that away to only having one escalator per term, so each extension term. So we kind of were able to trim some back there. Um, we also... There were a lot of restrictions that the landlord had on uh, the dispensary that were really just kind of, I don't know, in the beginning, everybody was afraid of a lot. Nowadays, a lot of this stuff's not a worry. So we got a lot more freedom and a lot more flexibility with the landlord. Um, and they're willing to allow us to obviously, you know, as long as we're within Boston code, you know, have appropriate signage, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think those are some things that are really key, but we really wanted to make the economics work very well. And, you know, we're on the hook here for, I mean, this is a big number. It's a big lease for many years. Um, you know, and so we wanted to go into it, you know, with the best possible chance of success for both us and the landlord. And this tiered structure, you know, fortunately worked for everybody. That's super helpful. Thank you for the very detailed information. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Any follow-up questions from any of the commissioners? All right, we will move to public testimony beginning with elected officials or their representative. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Maggie Van Swoy from the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. At this time, our office would like to defer to the judgment of the board on this application. We held an abutters meeting on December 12th where a number of questions were asked and answered, but no specific concerns were raised. The applicant has also reached out to the Fenway Civic Association and the Audubon Circle Neighborhood Association. Our office is unaware of any concerns at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other elected officials or their representatives that would like to speak? Sienna, would anyone else like to speak on this proposal? All right, seeing no hands raised, we'll take this matter under advisement. Thank you, Matt. Thank, Thank you. you all very much. Those were all the matters before the board today. The board's voting meeting will take place next Wednesday, January 24th at 1 p.m. The information to access the voting hearing will be on our website, boston.gov backslash cannabis. Again, the record will be kept open until next Tuesday, January 23rd at 5 p.m. Thank you all for attending today and enjoy the rest of your day.